Welcome to Mid-Century Living, your weekly nostalgia podcast about the best of technology and culture from the mid-20th century. Welcome to episode 53 of Mid-Century Living, the show where we talk all about the best of the mid-20th century and how to add the vintage vibes to your modern life. We are hosts, Gonzalo. And Jackie, thank you for joining us today. So today we're talking about the do-it-yourself boom in the 1950s. But first, Gonzalo, how was your Halloween? My Halloween was great. Okay, so first of all, actual Halloween day, like the 31st of October from a Thursday. Um, and I did what I always do, which is turn my porch lights off and like not participate. And I chose instead to spend the time studying for an upcoming certification test that I have. So I was being productive and adultish. But on Friday, we went to a Halloween party. Uh, my friend and listener to the show, Hannah, Hi, Hannah, always hosts a Halloween party that's themed. And this year's theme was Tim Burton. Yay. So um, we went, my girlfriend and I went as the Maitlands, uh, which hopefully you guys out there in podcast land know uh, Adam and Barbara Maitland were the original owners of the house that Beetlejuice is set in. So they're the, the, the ghosts, the ghost couple. And I think we nailed it. Um, I think you did too. You sent yeah. me pictures. Um, how did you, was there like a costume contest or something? It was just. There was a costume contest. Uh, the winners of the costume contest were two people who were dressed as Wednesday Adams. The hostess, Hannah, and then our friend Noor, uh, they they both dressed up as Wednesday and they like absolutely nailed it. <laughs> like which which Wednesday? Um I would say Christina Ricci. Okay, cool. Good. They they were amazing. A second place second place went to a couple that was dressed as alien. Not like alien like the, the alien thing. But like like the astronauts with the alien coming out of them, oh, um, which it looked very NSFW type thing coming out of their stomachs. That those aren't Tim Burton movies. No, I know, but anyway. I would have disqualified them. But I'm uh, gonna stick with for the rules. <laughs> uh, third place. Who was third place? I don't remember. Oh, it was uh, so the Night Before Christmas, Jack Skellington, and Sally, but because. It, there was a couple, but because the the girl her name is actually Sally, she was Jack Skellington, and the husband was Sally. I love that. That's funny. They they the makeup was amazing. The uh, Sally, the character, not the person, like was really into it. Did a really good job at uh, walking around and being Sally. That's awesome. But, yes, and there was also another couple that was dressed as the Maitlands. And it was funny because, well, two two reasons. One, we pulled up literally five minutes after they had pulled up to the party. So we walk in and the the, the host, the owner of the house, like, was like, hey, you guys, you know, the other couple uh, just walked in like literally like five minutes ago and they're dressed like you. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other funny part about it is that uh, the other Adam and I were talking and he goes, that shirt looks like looks just like mine. And I go, yeah, I bought it on Amazon. He goes, I bought mine on Amazon. Did you buy it last night? And I go, no, I didn't buy it last night. I bought it last week. Uh, but I don't know how we got into like, what brand is it? And it turned out to be the same exact shirt. Good. So. The official Adam Maitland shirt of Amazon. <laughs> yes. But, and everybody, the whole night was like, so y'all's outfit, did y'all already have that? Or, or like, did you just go to your closet? And like, oh, I, for everything except for the black and white checkered shirt. I was wearing this shirt actually underneath it. Yep, because he has a red shirt underneath. That's yeah. awesome. So that was mine. Well, that sounds like fun. Yeah. How was your Halloween? My Halloween was great. The uh, I find I finished my dress literally down to the wire. Like I hemmed it on Monday, and Halloween was on Thursday. I wish I had gotten it done earlier so I could have worn it more than once. Because really, the only time I got to wear it out in public was at work on Halloween day. We didn't go out on Halloween night. We always stay home because I want to. Because um, I actually 
like I just like to make Halloween snacks and like watch a scary movie and just like listen to the kids running around in the street and having a good like Halloween night like I always want to be at home on Halloween night what so what what we've been refining however is how involved we want to get in trick-or-treaters because I would love to just open the door every time a trick-or-treater rings the bell but we have two cats and they are they're not really like bolty but I don't want them to decide Halloween nights the night to just take off running out the door and like usually it's rainy in October and there's a ton of mosquitoes so every time we open the door like a mosquito flies in the house and like so we've been trying to come up with some like perfect way to just put candy outside for kids to come get so we can leave our porch light on and hand out candy but not actually be obligated to like live next to the door the whole night so we can still watch a scary movie Mm -hmm. so I've been like refining my like treat table for the past three Halloweens. So today, this was our third Halloween in the house and I really decorated it. I put like little lanterns on. I got multiple snacks. So last year we actually had to, or boyfriend had to run to the store for emergency chocolate. After I remember an this. Because it <laughs> ran out. So this time I was super prepared and I got a variety of snacks. I got cho- like a bag of chocolate and I got like spooky gummies from Trader Joe's and I got like spooky shaped pretzel bags if anyone wanted something salty and I got this like really cute cauldron and I filled it up and made a sign in -in glow-in-the-dark paint that said please take one or two and I like decorated the table and I had the whole thing and it was a huge hit like so I put it out around like 6 30 around sunset and refilled it it was it wasn't completely out but it was like almost running out by seven something so I refilled it at seven and then around eight o'clock and maybe this is or eight thirty I was gonna go out and refill it again but we heard some kids on bikes driving around our yard just like on bikes and then we heard laughter and let's go and then we went outside and they stole the whole cauldron oh they luckily left everything else on the table like including the hand-painted sign, which took me an hour. But um, they took the whole cauldron full of whatever was left in the cauldron. And the cauldron, which was 10 bucks from Target, by the way. And was also a punch bowl. And I never got to use it for anything else. Oh, I'm sorry that happened. But, so, I don't know if the answer is just take everything in at 8 o'clock and turn the lights off give two solid hours to those pure of heart to trick-or-treat, and then, like, just take everything in by the time the, like, mean kids come out later. Mm -hmm. I really just thought people would dump the whole thing in their bag, and that's why, like, I only filled it out. I filled it up in, like, phases on purpose, because I was like, if anyone dumps this cauldron in their their candy bag, it never occurred to me that they'd take the whole thing. Yeah, I'm I'm hopeful that, like, You'll come home from work this week and like there'll be like a half empty cauldron or a completely empty cauldron just like on its side in your front lawn. That's what I was hoping is that someone would just bring it back empty. Did you put up a sign, like a lost lost puppy <laughs> lost sign? Cauldron. I should I should just put like flyers on the <laughs> Like just return the cauldron, it was ten bucks. <laughs> but, then, <laughs> but then I suppose on some level, like it is mischief night. And it was a harmless thing. Like, yeah. All of the stuff that I cared about, no one, they didn't like egg the house. Like, yeah. it, like there are worse things kids t- could do on Halloween. It was still overall a like perfect night. And I had the Friday off so I could <laughs> recover from the Halloween blues at, in the safety of my own home <laughs> instead of at work. I had a Friday off too. And I went to vote for my first time ever. Yeah, you're right. We didn't even talk about important life events. Yeah, whenever we you know when, when you guys are listening to this out in podcast land, we already have a new precedent. Uh, but we are recording before election day, <laughs> so anyway, that's it. The um, picture of you when you became a citizen, holding your little American flag in your suit, is the picture I have of you on my phone, like as your Aww. contact photo. By the way. Oh. <laughs> Well, now that we're all caught up, let's get on with the show. So basically today I wanted to talk about um, something I didn't really realize was a thing until I read a very interesting article about it that we will link in the show notes. But apparently there was a huge do-it-yourself boom in the 1950s. The term was actually coined in the 1950s. 
Um, but first, so Gonzalo, do you tend to DIY your own projects? Um, okay. DIY and I have a very troubled relationship because I love the idea of the DIY. I love doing things like building and, you know, being crafty or being like gun ho with like power tools, building stuff. But I'm not lazy. I'm just tired all the time. <laughs> and the idea of sitting down on a Saturday or a Sunday, my only two days of rest and like spend the whole day doing something to my house, just like fill me with dread. So I wait until the summer when I have, <clears throat> you know, more time. That makes and, sense. And then I do some DIY. Like the last thing I've done, I did to my house that was totally DIY was my study, which is where I record. So if you guys have seen us on YouTube, you've seen my study, which is like, in my opinion, the best decorated room in the house. So. <laughs> well, I um, also, I feel you on the, these are my two days off. I don't want to do any work thing mm -hmm. but i so um but i do love to do things by myself wherever possible mainly for money saving reasons and it is really satisfying when you're done mm -hmm. and it is so we i mentioned on the pod before that we just redid the bathroom and by we i mean me the boyfriend helped with the sink <laughs> yeah. um and that because i don't have any time it took like a whole year but I loved it. And then as soon as I was done, I turned around. I was like, so what else can we do around that? <laughs> and like immediately set, like set down to start like mood boarding a backyard remodel I want to do because we could really use some landscaping back there to make it a more like relaxing space. I um, love DIY in theory and I do like arts and crafts projects. Um, so and that's technically DIY, which actually brings us to. The meat of this podcast. So while DIY really boomed in the 1950s, it actually got started before, uh, earlier than you might think, actually. So Gonzalo, why don't you tell us about the pre-mid-century history of the do-it-yourself movement? So, yes, um, I will once again take up the mantle of the resident uh, history nerd. So at, at the earliest beginnings of DIY or really arts and crafts go as far back as the Victorian age. Women were the original DIYers around this uh, around the home, but they were mostly decorative projects. At this time, home repair was still mostly hired out or handled by servants. But the idea of do-it-yourself for larger home projects was beginning to pop up in publications thanks to, quote, labor saver inventions. So these were tools or gadgets that you could build to assist with the housework. They were featured in publications such as Popular Science, which was first published in 1872, and Popular Mechanics, which was first published in 1902. And the only thing I can think of whenever I was reading this earlier was an episode of Downtown Abbey where the housekeeper buys herself a toaster and doesn't know how to use it. So, like, she makes a lot of smoke. And the butler runs in the room with, like, a bucket of sand thinking that there's a fire in the house. <laughs> I'm hopeful that that actually was a scene that played out in many houses during the early 1900s. I'm sure it was. Yeah. But as we got into the 1930s, uh, the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938 meant that work hours were set at just 40 hours a week, meaning that men had more leisure time. And the first known use of the term do-it-yourself came from this early age, but it was not really widely known. The first how-to book on home maintenance was published in 1931 by C.T. Schaefer. And as we moved into the 1940s, quote, make it yourself... Uh, an extremely popular weekly newspaper column by Julian Starr uh, was published. And eventually he turned these columns into a book of the same name. And there was even a follow-up book, 50 Things to Make for the Home, a how-to manual published just as the U.S. entered World War II. As we entered the war, people who were particularly handy were hired to work for the war effort. So with a shortage of qualified repairmen, all families were expected to do more with less and learn to support and repair their homes themselves. To help with this, organizations such as the YWCA organized classes to bring basic home repair and maintenance to women. So post-war, entering the 1950s, um, after the war ended, there was a home building boom, thanks to the GI Bill for returning veterans. More people than ever were becoming homeowners. Only 3 million families owned home at the turn of the century, while by 1960, 30 million did. 
And as home ownership boomed, the do-it-yourself movement also boomed. The only two hobbies that were more popular than do-it-yourself in the 1950s were reading and watching television, which are <laughs> two very different things. Things. <laughs> yes, it was either sit on your butt or do something. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but now that we've gotten to the boom in the 1950s, like when I say boom, I'm not kidding. So on June 2nd, 1952, Business Week actually proclaimed the 1950s as the age of do it yourself. But outside of home ownership, what created this boom? Men were back from the war, and home DIY projects kept them in the home and part of family life without emasculating them. There's something very manly you could do around the house. Um, to keep interesting what, was there like an issue with veterans come i guess they come back they don't exactly all have jobs at first so to keep them from like you know reliving their like they're spending the whole day at the bar yeah okay i see that it's like a positive thing yeah exactly so it's something productive you can do with the family or at the home while still keeping busy mm -hmm. and being useful when you're not at work or anything while you're adjusting. But then there was also wives who had worked outside of the home during the war effort that are now back at home too, with many more skills than before. So they're also looking for activities. Yeah. <laughs> the prevailing thought at the time was also that the pleasure and the joy of working on something with your own hands has psychological benefits, but more on that later. There was also an increase in DIY workshops and classes being offered. Hardware stores offered classes called repair clinics. So before World War II, companies with construction projects didn't advertise to the DIYer for fear of alienating their commercial clients, but this changed after the war. One of the first companies to advertise to DIYers was Kentile. Kentile? Kentile. You can tell I don't do a lot of DIY. This might be a company I'd heard of. But anyway, <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> they actually had advertisements showing homeowners how you could easily upgrade your floors over the weekend by yourself. Ooh, that's ambitious. It is ambitious. Um, you couldn't open a newspaper or magazine without do-it-yourself ads and articles jumping off the page. Products once marketed only to professionals now introduced easier-to-handle products such as latex paint, easy cleanup with water, or pre-pasted wallpaper. Magazines and other publications for the home handyman also began in the 1950s. Publishers Weekly began a series of how-to-do-it books in 1950. The Family Handyman and Workbench Magazine were both founded in the early 1950s and are still published today. And in 1951, three of the top five nonfiction bestsellers were related to the do-it-yourself boom. Huh. The do-it-yourself movement also gave rise to the home improvement industry. Power tools became much more affordable. Manufacturers started to make tools out of lighter and less expensive aluminum rather than steel. Manufacturers also brought industrial designers on board to design tools that were not only useful but attractive to look at in the home workshop. Fun fact, it was during this time period that DeWalt introduced its first line of tools in the yellow color that they're famous for today. I love DeWalt tools. Um, I have Is DeWalt. Is it because they're yellow? <laughs> I guess, subconsciously they are. I just like, okay, it was funny because as we were researching this and as you were talking just now, like it never crossed my mind that we needed industrial designers to make things more attractive. They're tools. They're supposed mm -hmm. to be utilitarian, useful. What does it matter how they look? But also, one of the reasons why I like the Walt is that everything matches. <laughs> <laughs> so if you open my toolbox, I've got matching things. Yes. But also, I never connected the need for industrial designers to come and make things look beautiful. Mm -hmm. But also, that's what I crave in my tools. <laughs> it helps. And if you're marketing directly to consumers, it certainly helps. Yes. Um, another direct-to-consumer fun fact is by 1953, 10% of the plywood manufacturer's product was being sold directly to homeowners. So that used to all go to contractors once, and now 10%. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not, not a lot, but not a little. Yeah, it's 10%. In 1954, Time Magazine published its August 2nd issue entitled Do It Yourself, The New Billion Dollar Hobby. Estimates state that in the 1950s, over 60 million Americans were involved in handyman-associated hobbies. There were even traveling roadshows and do-it-yourself conventions. Men would revel in the newest tool, meet others like themselves, and swap workshop stories. So in 1957, there were reports in the New York Times that there were, quote, nary an unaltered house in Levittown. So remember Levittown from our episodes on the suburbs? William Levitt and his company, Levitt and Sons, uh, created these. These developments sprang up in the late 1940s to early 1950s. 
Many of the homes in Levittown were only two-bedroom homes with, quote, expansion attic spaces as a way to keep initial costs down and make a new home affordable to all. So these homes often came with unfinished areas that the home handyman could finish. During this time, every male homeowner carved out a home workshop, usually in the garage or the basement. Having a home workshop gave men an individual identity. Working on projects at home also gave men a satisfaction that they may not be getting from work. But DIY wasn't just popular in the suburbs. In 1951 and 1952, New York's Museum of Modern Art, or MoMA, had DIY workshops in its People's Art Center. These were art and craft classes for amateurs, men, women, and children. These courses were part of the center's broader purpose and focus, which was, in the words of the director of MoMA, the individual's need for self-expression. And there was a very popular woodworking course specifically introduced for fathers and sons aged 11 to 14. In 1951, media released, MoMA said that the woodworking course provided father-son bonding opportunities through DIY projects. The release said, quote, Fathers and sons will work together making toys, games, and simple woodworking projects such as table lamps, art easels, silver chests, and hanging shelves. An article in the New York Times in 1952 noted that the woodworking workshop provided opportunities for apartment-dwelling fathers and sons to connect through DIY in the same way that their, quote, suburban counterparts might bond in their home garage workshop. Actually, that's pretty cool. Isn't it? Yeah, because... Yeah, like, they sp- of course, yeah, people, you always picture people going in the garage to work on things and inviting their sons to come help or whatever, but what do you do if you don't have a garage? Yeah. So... DIY didn't just stop when the 50s stopped, obviously. There's a little bit in the 60s and 70s as well. So in the 1950s, though, home DIY was used mainly to save money while keeping up with the Joneses. But in the 1960s and 70s, hippies kind of evolved DIY and used it as a way to live outside of the mainstream consumer culture. DIY was a way to live a self-sustaining life and to overcome a reliance on the mainstream. There were many countercultural manuals and catalogs published at this time that included how to information on a variety of topics and types of small scale projects, including housing. One really popular example of this kind of catalog was the Whole Earth Catalog. This is a magazine and product catalog published several times a year between 1968 and 1972. The editorial focus was on self sufficiency, ecology, alternative education, do it yourself, and holism, and featured the slogan Access to Tools. Steve Jobs once compared the Whole Earth Catalog to modern internet search engines. Um, He said this during his June 2005 Stanford University commencement speech. Interesting. (laughs) Now that we're where the hippies are, we're kind of, (laughs) it's a good time to bring up the concept of DIY and the self. So the most obvious benefit of doing something yourself rather than hiring someone else to do it is that it's way cheaper. But saving money is not the most important benefit of DIY. It's also great for your mental health. Julian Starr, who we mentioned earlier, who published one of the first how-to books, was really passionate about this idea. He said, quote, As one progresses in the use of tools, the basement workshop will become a place of refuge, a source of rejuvenation for a spirit bewildered or worn by the vicissitudes of ordinary existence. Hmm. Basically, scientists and psychologists agree that the transition from work to play should be mental as well as physical. DIY projects are actually a proven psychological release from the challenges of mentally challenging 9-to-5 office jobs. So while you're saving money by doing something yourself, the bigger benefit should actually be the sense of self-satisfaction from creating something beautiful with your own hands. I like that. I like that. And I feel like, to me, DIY has always been referred to as like, I am fixing my house or I'm decorating. But it could also be like instead of going out and buying a model airplane, building your old model airplane model, it's still DIY, but it's still something that challenges you mentally in a different way that your job would be. So you can come home, stress from work, sit down with your project, right? For a little bit and uh, get like, I don't know, in a better mental space to like enjoy your evening, not just sit there on the couch brain fried because of work yeah and i think it's so funny that both of us talked about how like tired we are after Mm -hmm. work and not having enough time to do this but i mean it is a very good point that sure you're still using your brain i guess our instinct is always like to turn your brain off immediately after work because you don't feel like you're recharging unless you're not thinking anymore yeah but thinking about something creative and just being really involved in the process and being mindful there is still rejuvenating and good for you. 
both physically and mentally. So that is a crazy to- concept that you that you've explained because there's this in fitness world, there's this like like trend towards like, oh, rest days suck because I'm not growing. Like that's what bros say. But also like you need a rest day. But there's also <laughs> this movement towards active rest where <laughs> you recover your body not by going to the gym and lifting weights or going for a long run, but also not by just going home and sitting on your couch. You get up, you move, right? You go for a walk or you do something light like that. And that's exactly what DIY is. It's You're not getting home from work stressed and then dropping everything and vegging out. You are using DIY to like rework your brain into being able to you know, enjoy the rest of the day. But yeah, it active rest is a great way to put it. And I think this is a good thing to keep in mind about DIY also. It's easy to to think about this as work, but it's really a hobby. Mm-hmm. Like and you should enjoy the process and it yeah. is also good for you. <laughs> yeah. So interesting kind of us talking about us is a good transition to the connection for today. Because what came off the do-it-yourself movement? That's the big question, right? Today, many men and women no longer have home workshops to retreat to. They may have man caves and she sheds. But as we know, no one's doing any work in there. That's just another place to watch TV. (laughs) As far as hobbies are concerned, television watching is still the most popular hobby in the U.S. Do-it-yourself style hobbies are no longer even in the top 10. One thing that certainly led to the decline in DIY was the rise of plant obsolescence in tools and appliances. Power tools that became cheaper in the 1950s through cheaper materials, but those cheaper materials meant that the tools didn't last as long. Now our power tools are combinations of plastic and rechargeable batteries, of which only 3.2% are recycled in the U.S. Additionally, assembly methods of products became cheaper and more automated, meaning sealed casings so you can't repair your tools on your own. But other than uh, that, it really seems like more of a spiritual problem because we no longer have a need to fix things. We just throw things away and move on and buy new. But I think probably a better way to reframe it is that even though you don't need to fix these things, you can still want to fix these things. So you can Mm -hmm. have the desire to dispose of less or the desire to work with your hands. And I think that's probably what we should be focusing on more. I love the idea of fixing something that's broken instead of... I like that idea. And yeah, it <laughs> that, uh, stretches to clothes because I remember when I was like soon after graduating college, and I had my first place and I had a roommate and one day they got home and I was on the couch mending socks. <laughs> so I was like, the socks so good. There's a hole in the toe. I can fix that and then wear it again. Mm-hmm. And he goes, you're and so weird. And it also applies to um, people who thrift. Like there's a lot you can gain from just learning how to sew a button and some other sort of mending tips Mm -hmm. because uh, a lot of people, if they don't throw it in the trash, they'll send it to thrift stores and you might find this totally fabulous thing that's just missing a button and you can fix the button. And now you have this new thing that you bought for $4 and you're letting it live on instead of being in a landfill. So even, even that kind of small scale DIY is important. But now that we're caught up to the present, we're back to our etiquette segment. Those of you who listened to us in October will remember that we did a spooky connection section instead of etiquette, but we're back. So now that we're not spooky anymore, it's time for our etiquette segment. So Gonzalo, what do we have today? So because our episode today talked about DIY, I want to talk a little bit about DIY adjacent etiquette. (laughs) So this etiquette segment once again comes from Amy Vanderbilt's Complete Book of Etiquette from 1958 actually comes from part four, household management, specifically chapter 37, furnishings in the established household, page 368. Actually, I don't know if that was actual page or not, but it felt appropriate. It sounded right, yeah. Uh, Anyway, Amy starts off this chapter with a great foreword describing how the times of servants uh, is essentially over, except for very specific or limited ways for establishments that still have live and help. But she says... Actually, living space is limited, so even those who have hired help don't have living help. Technology has simplified living and has made it so that women of the household can function with limited help. And Amy says, quote, in many ways it's better, but whether we like it or not, we can never go back. Though We must master the new ways and master the new skills, end quote. 
So regarding decorating or DIYing yourself, DIYing yourself, doing it yourself, yourself. Solid. Good you know, English skills. I was thinking about that while I was writing this episode. I think DIY on its own is more of a word in itself now and not so much an acronym because you can say things like DIYers yeah. and like as people who do DIYs. True. I think it's gone beyond. But being a teacher, I have to say it correctly. So decorating it or be doing it yourself. I Y. Right. The verb is the D, doing it yourself. Yeah, it's like Coles de Sac. Like you want to say, that's a whole other rap. Yeah, that's that is a kind of worms we're not opening today. But <laughs> many books have been written on the subject of DIY. Many magazines deal extensively in this. Sassy Amy says, quote, if your taste is uninformed, perhaps because you've never given the matter thought, you can and should learn from these, these sources. So basically she's saying, start by looking. Read books, read magazines, travel to places that will prove an inspiration and delight. She suggested Jefferson's Monticello estate, which is amazing, yes, but not mid-century. So I was very confused as to why she said that in her book. But she said about it, drinking the colors of the walls, the handmade brick, then travel to New York City and visit the MoMA, visit antique shops, go to beautiful homes in your communities that are open to uh, each year to the public. Keep a scrapbook of color swatches and materials to develop your own taste, then build your home around this. Yes, you can ask a decorator for help, specifically with help with, with, of what you've learned, but she says to never let a professional superimpose his taste on yours. And also never decorate in haste, trying to complete the whole picture within a four-wall frame at once. That's good advice. Yeah. Regarding planning of the room, right? Good modern rooms come to life with old glass, a piece or so of antique furniture, or an old painting. But a room is made better when graced by antiques and be more comfortable for its present-day roomy sofa and freedom from what she calls frou-frou which I took to be like extra freely, but also like extra stuff that has no use. Mm -hmm. The living room must have one or more really comfortable chairs, preferably with some equipment such, a, such as a hassock that permits the elevation of the feet. The sofa should be as big as the space allows and have an adjacent coffee table for ashtrays, cigarettes, and drinks. I thought it was very funny that those are the three things that she said we need space for. The, the essentials. Yes. Furniture should be grouped with a main center of interest, this being fireplace or the view. Today, right, in modern times, we call that a TV. Mm -hmm. Rooms don't have to look completely new all the time. Quote, it will be more comfortable for an occasional bit of genteel shabbiness. <laughs> the most livable rooms reflect the interests and hobbies of the owners. And regarding choosing furniture, our surroundings, she says, should take into consideration our physical appearance. Here's Sassy Amy again saying, quote, The possessor of a six foot two big boned husband is plain silly to expect him to sleep comfortably in a spool bed she hopefully imagines is big enough for two. <laughs> that being said, similarly, it's inappropriate for a small family to have larger than life furniture. Amy says that they'll get lost and make themselves look smaller still. So, what do you think of these etiquette rules? I think these are great rules. I really loved the inspiration section, like keeping a scrapbook of color swatches and really taking your time decorating a space. Mm -hmm. I agree, but I will say I fall victim to the hurrying up because when I start a DIY project, I want it done. Mm. So I want to enjoy it being done. And the first hour, I'm like gung-ho about it. Second hour, I'm less so. And by the third hour, I'm like, I just want to get done. Just paint, just paint, just paint. <laughs> so. Yeah. But I do agree with them. And I think we should okay them and give them the stamp of approval. Let's dust it off because we haven't used it for a month. <laughs> yes, I agree. I approve. Good. So with that approval, uh, it looks that we have landed the plane. Thank you all for listening today. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe to the show and tell a friend. You can also follow us on YouTube and Instagram at MCL Podcast. Instagram is the best place to send us feedback and episode suggestions, so send us a DM anytime. You can also contact us through our new Send Us a Text Message feature in the show notes. And if you do, we'll read it on our next episode. Yeah, so send us some fan mail. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you again next week. Bye! 
Thank you for listening to Mid-Century Living. Please subscribe, tell your friends, and leave a review. We are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also follow us on Instagram at MCL Podcast. See you next Friday.